Okay, good morning to everyone joining us from all over the world. Доброе утро, Канада, Erev Tov, Israel. Дорогие лимудники, если вам комфортнее слушать интервью по-русски, то, пожалуйста, сейчас нажмите кнопку внизу экрана, которая называется Interpretation. Um, and so, we begin. My name is Dan, and I am delighted to start this day with some much-needed positivity. On behalf of Limud FSU Canada, I am thrilled to welcome you to this coffee chat. As you sit there and listen, if you have any questions today, feel free to type them into the chat at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them at the end. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank a few people who make these events possible. From Limud FSU International, Chaim Chesler, Sandy Khan, and Natasha Chechik, the president of Limud FSU International, Aaron Frankel, the chairman of the steering committee, Matthew Bronfman, and our country director here in Canada, Mila Vajchansky. And now, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our Matthew Bronfman is an American businessman, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. He's a proud supporter of the Limud FSU project since 2009 and the chairman of the International Steering Committee. Good morning, Matthew. Hi, Dan. How are you? Good. How are you? Are you drinking? Uh, is your coffee ready? Are you all good for uh, all stuff? Uh, for coffee chat? I think it's it, it's coming in in a second, but we, we can definitely begin. Yeah. Well, uh, here it is as we speak. Look, there look at that. <laughs> Why don't you, how do you drink your coffee? I see, is there ice in it? I see it's- Yeah, uh, it's an ice, it's, it's an ice coffee with oat milk. Wow. Oh. Yes, I, I have mine with almond milk. Um, but I guess it, it makes sense to have iced coffee if you're in Tel Aviv. How's Tel Aviv right now? Um, quiet, although a lot more traffic today than the last three or four weeks since we, we've been here. Um, because you're allowed to go to work, although you no know, customer facing work, uh, but, you know, the beaches are full because people are allowed, sorry, I'm just trying to get a full screen. People are allowed to exercise. So people are all, there are more people doing paddle boarding than have ever paddle boarded before and jogging and power walking. So uh, the weekend was actually really beautiful and a lot of people out walking around, running around, exercising. Well, at least, uh, at least people are, are getting more fit during this time. Yes. That's one thing yes. to come out of this. Um, so... Uh, today, I'll, I'll be asking you some questions for which uh, the answers are more difficult to come by in a simple Google search. So yes, we'll okay. be talking about your professional life, but we'll also focus on uh, your roots and your values and what you hold dear. And okay. uh, I'd like to begin with uh, your roots. So uh, I'll start with something that you said at a Limud conference a few years ago. Uh, you said, I'm an American, my father is Canadian, and my ancestors are from Moldova. You tell me what my origin is. In, in 1891, your family immigrated to Canada. And now in 2012, more than 120 years later, Matthew, something monumental happened in your life. For the first time, you took a trip back to Moldova, a town called Ataki, where your ancestry is from. So the first thing I, I wanted to ask you is, could you tell us a bit, a bit about your 2012 trip to Moldova? How did it feel uh, walking on the same roads as your great grandparents? Uh, well, first, thank you for, for the kind introduction. Uh, and most people say that I'm Canadian uh, because as you mentioned, because my father uh, was born and grew up in Canada, uh, but I, uh, he married, my mother's American and I was born in New York with Chaim. Uh, we went, we went together to Moldova and we had quite, quite a, an experience of a trip, uh, touring around Kishinev first. And then the delegation getting up to Ataki, uh, was quite, quite a, an interesting event because the bus broke down uh, about halfway there. It was, it was like a three hour bus trip and, and we we're all on the side of the road for like an hour and a half while they were trying to get us another bus and. Anyway, so that was, it was interesting. We, um, we uh, you know, we, we, uh, when, we, when we got there, there was this beautiful ceremony and they welcomed us and put this sash on me. And it was a little bit, it was a little bit surreal. And, but, you know, as you say, to walk in the footsteps of, of my great grandfather, because my grandfather was maybe six months old or something when they left in the, eight, in the 18, late 1880s. Um, 
it was very bizarre. And, you know, Ataki doesn't seem like it's really changed a whole lot. I don't know, Haim can, can uh, attest to that uh, since that time. We went, we found the Jewish cemetery. We didn't actually find the actual tombstone of uh, might would have been my great great grandparents, um, but it was you know it was fascinating just to see what in a way in a way it was great for me to that it hasn't evolved and become too metropolitan uh, and and hasn't gentrified too much to sort of have a little bit of a glimpse into what life might have been like for my great grandparents. Of course, we were there on a pretty day. It was, the weather was was fine. Um, it wasn't, you know, cold and snowing and raining, and God knows what uh, conditions were really like when when they lived there. Uh, but it was really, it was really interesting just to go back to that part of the world. Um, obviously, we all know what happened in Kishinev in, in 1903 and the programs that happened even in earlier times. Uh, so it was, it was, you know, that whole pale of settlement uh, was, which was filled with with Jewish shtetls all over. You know, lived through many, many, many hard times, and my ancestors were brave enough. Uh, and I still marvel at, you know, not just obviously mine, but all of our ancestors who who left uh, left the Russian Empire for for the Promised Land, whether it's Canada or, or the United States or Israel or anywhere that they went to pick up and move, not knowing where they were going or what life would be like, and not speaking the language. That I think that takes a lot more guts than I think I probably have. And. Um... In uh, in a video that I saw of your trip on on YouTube, um, your your daughter was there as well, right? I imagine yeah, yeah. it was my daughter uh, Sasha. Unforgettable and meaningful trip for her as well. It certainly was, and you know we went to what was previously been the synagogue, which was has, was now just a shell um, of the synagogue, and there were trees and roots and grass, you know, everywhere. Um, and we tried to envision sort of what it would have been like to go and, and pray on on Friday nights and Saturday mornings there. And I think it was, you know, I have a lot of kids. So to be able to do one-on-one -on -one trips to, to in those particularly meaningful, forget, I'll never forget being able to do that with her. Um, it was really a special experience. And, you know, as you get farther and farther away, as the generations pass from one to the next, I think it's, it's even more important to try to keep these stories fresh and the reality fresh uh, uh, because Look, you see what's going on with the rise of anti-Semitism around the globe and, and all the other issues that are coming up. And, and I think that, that American, the next generation, the millennial generation of American Jews, and I can't really speak to the Canadian Jews, I'm not close enough to it, but there's, there's a disconnect between, between them and Israel that, that is growing and much, a much bigger divide than in my generation. And so being able to take my kids, whether to Israel or to to Eastern Europe and, and see our roots, I think is, is critically important uh, so we can keep uh, that connection as close as humanly possible. Yeah, I like what you said about that, keeping the stories, those stories fresh. I think that's, that really is a, a, at the core of, uh, mm -hmm. of how we solve many of the issues that are taking our world uh, by storm today. Right. And since we're already, we started talking about your family, I, I want to um, uh, turn to your last name, Brownfman. Um, yeah. Not many people know that uh, the prefix bronf is Yiddish for distilled liquor. Uh, <laughs> and your family is well known to being a giant in the liquor industry in North America. So I guess my question to you is, uh, did your last name determine your family's fate or uh, was the name given after the fact? Could you tell us about how all of it started? You know, it's, it's a great question, Dan. And uh... I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, you know, we we think the name was Bronfman or Bronfen before uh, they immigrated to Canada because when they immigrated to Canada, they didn't start off in the whiskey business. Uh, my my grandfather they said he was only a few months old when they went to Canada, and he ended up sort of reverse engineering himself into the into the liquor business in in his late teens and early twenties. So I think it was. It was Providence, it was Beshert, it wasn't, uh, we don't have any evidence. And I've asked my uncle, my uncle Charles Bronfman, uh, who is uh, gonna be 90 on his next birthday. And I've asked him and he, you know, he says, no, they weren't, they, they were farmers, but they weren't in the beverage alcohol business back in the old country. So uh, perhaps it was just, uh, you know, meant to be. 
right. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, so, and, 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 and I'll just add one because we have we're, we do have time. So, actually, about a, a year and a half ago, I became chairman of a company called Next Century Spirits, which is a technology company uh, uh, in in the beverage alcohol business. And uh, so, so may, maybe even though my my family uh, sold uh, Seagram about twenty years ago, uh, maybe we'll be back in the beverage alcohol business. And my son. My 20 year old son has just started a company. It's, it was supposed to launch in April, but because of COVID it didn't. And it's, and it's called SESH and it's uh, pre-packed uh, um, hard, hard seltzer, uh, which is a very fast growing category. So I guess somehow it's still in our DNA even though the, the, the mothership was, was sold 20 years ago. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's genetic or, or predetermined. There's no way out for you. <laughs> no, there's no way out. <laughs> Um, I'd like to uh, turn to your uh, father, Edgar Bronfman. Yeah. He was the president of the World Jewish Congress from 1981. And under his leadership, the World Jewish Congress united Jewish communities from more than 80 countries around the world. And many people know this, but what many people don't know is that in 1985, Edgar Bronfman personally delivered a letter from Shimon Peres, the then uh, Prime Minister of Israel, to Mikhail Gorbachev, a letter that sparked diplomatic relations between Israel and the Soviet Union. And shortly after, the negotiations between Israel and the Soviet Union took place in the Bronfman household in Washington. And a few years later, my family, among hundreds of thousands of other Jewish families, were able to immigrate into Israel out of the USSR as a result of these efforts. Matthew, how do you remember these monumental events that your father was involved in? Can you share anything interesting from this period? And today as his son, we, we can say that mm. your position in Limud FSU is a continuation of his legacy and uniting and bringing together Jewish people all around the world. Could you talk a bit about that? Sure, listen, talk, talking about my dad is, is always a pleasure to be, to be honest with you. Uh, he, he was, you know, there, there were in, in my mind, in a funny way, there were, there were two, uh, two different people almost. There was Edgar Bronfman, sort of the, the leader, uh, the Jewish leader, the leader of a big international company, and there was my dad. Um, and, you know, those, those things uh, sort of weaved in and out in, in our lives as, as his children. Um, he, he was very, very determined very, very determined uh, to give back and to leave the world a better place and particularly, obviously, for, for the Jewish people. And, and he was involved in a number of charities. And then in, in 1979, he became acting uh, president of the World Jewish Congress. And as you mentioned, in 81, he became uh, president. And he resigned from basically all other charitable activities and focused uh, specifically on, on uh, on world Jewry and as you said, bringing communities together. Um, and of course the big issue of the day, the biggest issue of the day then was, was the Soviet Jewry movement. And you know, the World Jewish Congress and my father were not the only ones by any stretch of the imagination involved in the Soviet Jewry movement. But you know, I think because of his force of personality, because of his uh, position as, as a international businessman, um, because of the hard work he did of traveling around Europe and meeting with many, many, many other leaders who all had the ability to connect uh, with, with Gorbachev. Um, he, he was able to, uh, to, get, to get ultimately the meetings that happened. And we have a, a long family history actually with Shimon Peres from my, from my grandfather's time from when Peres was a young man. Uh, on one of his first missions to North America, he met with my grandfather. Uh, and there's also a long, very funny story that, that Shimon used to tell about my grandfather. But, you know, my father, he really had it in his, in his, in his deep in his kishkas that he, that he needed to do something because we were so privileged. Uh, and that we had been able to get out, you know, as you said, my, his grandparents had left uh, the Russian empire to, to try to get uh, the, the next generation of Jews and let them in. By the way, What's interesting, I don't think many people know this about my father. My father did not insist that Jews go to Israel. 
he was focused on really three, really, really two things. One is to allow any Jew who stayed behind to be able to practice their Judaism. And that really was, and you know, when I met Chaim Chester, by the way, it was at a World Jewish Congress event in Spain. And if I'm not wrong, Chaim, you correct me, I think it was 2004 or 2005. Um, so sort of the worlds converged between the World Jewish Congress and Limud, and it became out of that meeting that Limud was started. So, you know, to continue that piece of it, which was that the Jews who stayed behind in, in, in what was then the Soviet Union uh, should be able to, to express their Judaism. Uh, and that those who left should have the choice to go to Israel, the United States, or wherever they wanted to. It wouldn't necessarily have to be Israel uh, because you know my father very much believed in freedom. Uh, and so many, many Jews went, um, you know, and obviously Aaron was very involved as well in uh, particularly the flights and organizing the flights and getting the air. Absolutely critical to the entire effort. Uh, and Aaron was really on the front lines of that. Um, so again, that, uh, and then in fact, our first Limud in Moscow, uh, which was a sort of a mini Limud, Aaron was there, took Chaim and me and, and Sandy to the Kremlin. So we've, you know, these things all have sort of really come together. Uh, but my father was was absolutely determined not to take and I, not to take any never to take no for an answer. And I actually told this story, and I'll tell it briefly at, at, at his memorial service, my dad's memorial service, that in 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 1990 uh, he was meeting with Gorbachev. I was in Moscow with him. I wasn't at the meeting, but I was in Moscow, and and my father my father went to see him, and, and Gorbachev did one of his typical launched into what would have been, you know, a half hour or 45 minute monologue. And, and after about five minutes, my father literally put up his hand and interrupted him and said, excuse me, sir, excuse me. He said, I know you're an incredibly busy man and I don't really want to waste your time. Can we please discuss the issues that we came here to talk about? And Gorbachev sort of took a pause. And in that moment, it was either he was going to throw my father out of the room, but he didn't. He, he respected my father for, for that. And it was, that was part of the, the, uh, the whole, you know, he went, he went from there to Shevardnadze's office and, and, the, and the conversations really, really took off. So he was not gonna be told no, he wasn't gonna, he, he had a force of personality that, you know, we, we, when I say we, I'm talking about his children and grandchildren, we love to tell stories about him because he had, he had an incredible sense of humor, and he, but he also had a very steely, determined view of what his mission in life was. And it was you know, to create a better world for, for his family and for the Jewish people. Uh, and, th and those really went together. They were not separate. And uh, you know, to the extent that uh, I am able to continue in certain ways his legacy, to expand them in other ways, uh, to do my own thing in Jewish life. It's because of the example of my father, my grandfather, my uncle Charles. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it gives me, you know, I, I, I often think that, you know, my dad would be smiling uh, for the work that, that I'm doing. And, uh, and that's, that's a nice feeling. That's a very nice feeling. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think that's how, when you're mission oriented and determined, that's that's how you you get things done. You you, you need to be you need to be tough, but uh, uh, but kind. And and it seems like um, like like your father was the best of both worlds. Uh, he really was. He our, really our, was. Yeah, our Jewish community all over the world is is very uh, grateful for for his legacy and and for your family. So so thank you. Um, you mentioned that you met uh, uh, Chaim Chesler at, uh, at the World Jewish uh, Conference, Congress Conference. Uh, when was that? So Chaim could give you the exact date. I think it was it was either 2004, 2005. It was in Cordoba, Spain. Uh, it was an OECD gathering as well. Um, and there was a World Jewish Congress conference going on. My father was one of the two keynote speakers at the OECD. and. Uh, that's when Chaim came up to me and he asked me about doing a Limud in, in the former Soviet Union because my grandfather had been born in Moldova. And, and I looked at him and I said, what's Limud? 
I, I'd never even heard of it, frankly, and even though it existed in London for 25 years prior. And, uh, and, and Haim explained it to me and, you know, we had some discussions and over the next couple of days and, and that was sort of how it all started. And you've been a supporter uh, of uh, Limud FSU for more than a decade now. So, well, really, really since, since 2005, actually. So it's about 15 years uh, that we've been partners with Sandy and then, uh, and uh, Aaron, I, I, I'm sure we're going to get the dates wrong, but at least ten, around 10 years ago, joined us as president. So uh, it was the three and then the four of us who have really been uh, working very closely together. And, you know, I think, it, you know, it's taken all of us, we all bring different strengths uh, and different viewpoints to, to the mood. And, and, uh, and that's, I think that's why we've been able, we all, we all bring different viewpoints and different uh, personalities to it. And, Collectively, we, we tend to get to the right answers of how we want to move forward. But as someone who grew up around North American culture, um, there were surely times when working alongside uh, Russian Jews in uh, <laughs> FSU posed a bit of a culture shock, right? So, so I, I wanted to ask you, can you share any fond or even funny moments that were caused by um, a difference in mentality? Uh, l- let me rephrase my question. Um, there, there's this saying that goes, um, Jews never complain because they feel bad. They feel bad when they have nothing to complain about. <laughs> so, so what I'm asking you, uh, Matthew, is uh, do you have any complaints about our Russian Soviet mentality? I definitely do not have any complaints about the Soviet Russian mentality. I will tell you uh, one of the highlights for me was, uh, well, there, there are a couple, but one, one certainly was in our very first Limud, uh, when having been, of course, as I mentioned, to, to, to Moscow a few times with my father uh, over the years. And then in 2005, we were at the, at the, the big synagogue uh, for morning services with, um, sorry, I just got a phone call. Um, and we, uh, we, we were, you know, we were with some some impressive uh, Israelis, some incredible rabbis, including Adin Steinsalt. And we walked from the synagogue back to the hotel on Saturday morning with our talit on right in front of the Kremlin. And that was just an extraordinary moment. And 15 years prior to that, it, you know, you probably would, you, you would have been, you may not have been shot, but you would have been worried that you would have been shot to walk on the streets of Moscow wearing uh, wearing a tali. Um, so that that was an inc- an incredible an incredible moment. Um, we were we were in Kazan. Uh, I don't you know the COVID has sort of made all the, the years pass by, but it was probably four years ago. And uh, and Chaim and Sandy dressed up in traditional uh, outfits and and that was certainly one of the, one of the things I saw the pictures in my phone was one of the, the great moments. I don't, I don't have my screen on, but I hope Sandy's smiling at that, at that memory. Um, uh, but no, I think, listen, we, I don't, I don't think that there's you know, huge differences. I mean, there are differences between people from Montreal and people from Toronto. So there's certainly be differences between Jews in Moscow and in Tel Aviv and in New York and, and everywhere else. Um, you know, I think we, we, we like to complain wherever we are. Um, but no, I don't have any complaints uh, about about uh, about our brethren in, in the FSU. Um, if, if there if there if there's one complaint, it's honestly it's the complaint I have about, about the millennials everywhere, and it's not really a complaint because it's not their fault. It's 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 our fault, if you will. It's my generation's fault, is that they're not as engaged in Judaism as we'd like them to be, right? And that's that's an educational issue, and that's you know you look at you look at um, assimilation, intermarriage in North America, and the numbers are staggering. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I get it. I, I feel very lucky that I have two sons married. They're both married to Jewish girls, but you know, it, it wasn't obvious. It wasn't obvious that that would happen. And that's uh, not the case and, for many people. Yeah. Uh, you know, and my, my next child is, I think, going to get engaged, uh, to girl, uh, and her, her about to be fiance is is from a mixed marriage where the father's Jewish, the mother's not. You know, and uh, I actually was thinking this morning about the conversation I need to have with him, uh, and it's going to be an awkward one to make sure that you know my grandchildren 
uh, are brought up the way it's important to me. But at the end of the day, it's I, you know, I can't, I can't actually impose it. It's not my, it's not my choice at the end of the day. But we need to do we, and I say collectively, we need to do, I think, a better job of educating our children Jewishly. Uh, we have so much to offer. We have so much to give to to all of us, to our to our kids, to to the world. But you know, we've got to start with 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 us. And it, whatever, no matter what you do, your no matter how much you teach your children, there's no guarantee. Okay, so that I think we all have to understand that and be aware of that. Um, but with without a Jewish education, you can pretty much guarantee without a Jewish household, without the rituals, without the understanding of the values, I think you pretty much guarantee that your grandchildren won't be Jewish. Um, there's no guarantee that they will be if you do everything that, you know, one that's comfortable for you and Jewishly. But if you don't, you pretty much can guarantee they won't be Jewish. And I, and I think that was, you know, a lesson. I can tell you that, you know, we were, even though my, both my parents were Jewish, obviously, we were not brought up in a, in, in a Jewish home. We were not bar and bat mitzvah. Uh, there were no Jewish holidays. And uh, my father was being interviewed on Charlie Rose one time and they were talking about Seagram and the sale of Seagram and all sorts of business stuff. And, and Charlie Rose said to my dad, uh, so what's, what's your biggest regret? <clears throat> and my dad said, you know, in business, Charlie, you make decisions based on all the facts and you weigh them, the pluses and minuses, and ultimately you make the best decision you can and, and hopefully you get more right than wrong, but you never really know. But my biggest regret is I didn't provide a Jewish home for my kids. And that's a pretty astonishing statement to make on national television during a conversation about business. Uh, he completely diverted because, and he realized, and, and there are five children, I'm the fourth of five, and only my really myself and my younger brother are bringing up our kids in a, in a Jewish home. And so that's why I say that from personal experience. It's not from uh, some theoretical experience or some analysis I've read, although I've read most of the analyses around as well. Wow. Yes, that's... Uh... Wow. Um, while, we're, <laughs> while we're on this more uh, theological subject, um, let me ask you this. Is there any quote or saying from the Torah, the Tanakh, or Talmud that gets you through life, through the day, that motivates you? Anything you can think of? Uh, not, I, would, I wouldn't say it's anything particular. I do. Uh, listen, I, I'm, uh, Aaron would, is much more knowledgeable about Torah than, than I am. Uh, so maybe that's a question more for him than for me. Um, but I do, you know, I do put on Talisman to fill in every morning. And at the end, I just say, honestly, I just say Toda. I just say Toda to Hashem for all the blessings in my life. And that includes the blessing of being able to do, to do good things for other people, you know, because I am incredibly blessed, fortunate both to have had, as I said, the example of my, of my uh, to be able to to do things and, and the inclination to spend time as well. Um, so there's nothing, you know, a lot of people say, you know, they quote Hillel or they, they you know, but I wouldn't say there's any particular quote uh, uh, that, that sort of is one that stands out particularly for me. Um, but I do, I do absolutely believe in a, in a higher power and a power greater than us. Um, you know, I call him Hashem and, uh, and I think that uh, he has he has been very inc incredibly gracious to me, um, and uh, and that's one of the things that you know we we do our best to to give back and uh, in many, in, me in many ways. But yeah. no, there's nothing. I'm not I'm not enough of a Torah scholar to pull one out a quote uh, that good. quickly. But, but gratitude is is very important. It's an important practice, and um, it's especially uh, important. In the times we're living now and I, and I want to turn to yeah. that in a second I, I just want to remind okay. all of you uh, that are with us today if you have any questions for Matthew you can type them into the chat at any time and uh, we will get to them at the end of our conversation but uh, right now let's turn to the period we're living in it's not an easy time for numerous months now 
We are surrounded left, right, and center by the COVID-19 pandemic. Businesses are suffering, charities and nonprofits are struggling, and I'm sure you would agree that philanthropy is needed now more than ever before. So my question to you, Matthew, is how do you think we can fill the gap between those in our communities who are in need and those who usually give, but now are trying to save? That's, that's, that's a great question. And obviously it's, it's local as well uh, because different communities have, di have different needs. Um, and I think that in, there are gonna be institutions that unfortunately are gonna close. You know, I can, and, and people are being laid off. You know, I'm, I, one of the charities that I'm involved with and have been involved with uh, for almost 30 years is the 92nd Street Y in New York. And, uh, you know, we've had to lay off people and we will continue to have to lay off people is my guess. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking. We've gone back to the board of trustees and, and the board has been really incredibly generous. Um, and I, I know, I think that that's really, that's what's gonna happen. First of all, I think we need, we need to expand the uh, sort of the breadth of, of potential donors. The problem is everybody's hurting. Um, I, and I shouldn't say everybody's hurting because uh, stock markets seemingly, uh, you know, undeniably high, and uh, I'm not sure. I'm not. And I'm not sure why. I I I don't really spend much time looking or uh, investing in the stock market, but it it's very high. I don't know what the American election will do to that. Um, but you know, char charities are hurting, so everyone's got to tighten their belts on the char on the charitable front. Um, you know, you look at Limud. We've you look at Birthright. Uh, you look at the Bronfman Youth Fellowships in Israel, all these things that have had to cancel. Um, and, and, you know, Nimud has pivoted to doing a lot of Zoom calls and online, and online learning and many, many things uh, that, is, that is fantastic to be able to continue the outreach and connection and learning. You know, but the, the in-person events, which are being, which are being canceled, is, it's very, very hard. Um, I think emotionally, it's very, very hard on people. Um, and from a philanthropic standpoint, you know, we're doing, we're doing extra, uh, but, you know, we can't, there's no way to fill, to fill the gaps. I, I think it's very hard to fill, to fill the gaps because, you know, I'm involved in, I don't know, half a dozen charities and everybody's asking for more. Um, and, you know, we're trying to do more across everything, but it's, it's hard, uh, it's hard to do that. And, um, and not everyone has the ability to do it. Uh, so, you know, I know in a number of cases, people are asking if you've got a long-term, you know, four or five, six year uh, pledge, could you please bring the money forward, uh, which is going to be very helpful in many cases. Um, but, you know, we also have to tighten our belts. Uh, that's just, that's the reality. It's reality in business and it's reality in philanthropy. Um, you know, I could go through what's going on in IKEA, I can, but, um, you know, it's just, it's a crazy time and we were discussing today, actually one of the hardest things is no one can really plan. You know, we don't know what's gonna be next week, next month, what the winter's gonna bring. Uh, we don't know, you know, it looks like there are increased lockdowns happening in Europe now. So nobody really knows what's happening and it's, and it's very, very, very disconcerting, I think for everybody. Um, and, you know, budgeting and planning is something we're all used to. We're all from, from you know, certainly from, graduate school on you spend a lot of time doing budgeting and planning and, and thinking and now I think it's all you know how do you do that how do you do it in today's world yeah I don't know if that was a specific enough answer but uh, it's a very complicated that's great. Time it's right now. complicated there's there, there's no way to plan for the future so um, I wanted to I guess turn to maybe maybe a bit more uh, um, a, a different uh, current event um, that uh, recently 11 uh, Nobel Prize laureates for 2020 were announced. And uh, out of the 11, five are Jewish. They received the prizes in physiology, economics, literature, and two in physics. Now, um, as we can imagine, uh, all of them spent many years in universities and academic institutions. And this leads me to uh, echo a different concern about universities, the concern of many Jewish parents all around North America who are skeptical 
of sending their children to college because of growing anti-Semitism. And you already touched on this today, but it's no secret that unfortunately, anti-Semitism is on the rise around the world, particularly on college campuses among millennials. So my question to you is if you could change the academic sphere in North America in any way, what would you implement to combat anti-Semitism on campuses? So I'm not, I'm not sure, so that, that's a great question. And, and I am involved with, with Hillel, um, particularly the Hillel at NYU. Um, I had children who have graduated from three different universities. Um, and it is, as you said very well, it is a growing problem and parents are concerned. And, you know, we, whether it's the, the AJC or Hillel, we are working, I think we, they are working tirelessly to, to combat anti-Semitism. We've had, for instance, you, I'll just give you an example at USC where, where my daughter graduated in, in May. Uh, AJC has convened meetings together with the Hillels, of, the Hillel of, of USC with the president and the, and the provost of the university to talk about uh, anti-Semitism on that, on that campus. The president has come out against it. You see what's going on at Columbia University recently. Uh, luckily, uh, the president of Columbia University came out very strongly uh, against BDS. Um, and look, we're, we're, we're facing a, uh, a real challenge from both the left and, and the far left and the far right. You know, historically, the Jews in Israel were the underdog. As a victim of our own success in the minds of others, we have become, you know, the Goliath and not, and not the David, not the underdog anymore. Um, one, of the, one of the things I think that needs to happen, and, and AJC has been doing this for many years, is bringing university presidents, provosts, dean to Israel to actually, and I'm talking about non Jewish uh, faculty and administrators for them to get a truly unvarnished view of what it's like to be in Israel, what it means to be here, what the dynamics are. I have to tell you that I think the peace deal, um, and, and I, I happen to be like the HAC, uh, very, very centrist, um, which is one of the reasons HAC, you know, I, I fit well into HAC is that we're both centrist. So I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be political at all here, but the fact that the Trump administration was able to broker the peace deal between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain, uh, I think is going to be very helpful in combating some of this anti-Semitism on campuses. Because the fact that the Emirates and the Bahrainis and now the Sudanese and maybe Oman are all going to make peace with Israel, the real peace with Israel, not sort of the cold peace of Jordan and Egypt from 25 and 30 years ago, uh, takes a lot of the wind out of the sails of, of Israel being negative in all their minds. And, the, and But we also have to do a better job of, of giving the real facts. Trips are great, trips are amazing, trips are important, but how many people can you take on trips to Israel? Uh, so I think we need to do much better job on campus. I think that the Hill at NYU has been doing a great job, but it's an uphill battle. Um, I'm not sure how many parents are not sending their children to, to university because of anti-Semitism on campuses. I think they're concerned about it. Um, and my hope is that both with, you know, beating back BDS, with strengthening Hillel, with the peace deal with, with a number of Arab countries, uh, we can start to change the narrative. I think it's very important. Um, you know, one of the things that, that um, Yehuda Sarna, who's, who's the Hillel rabbi at NYU, has done has been he's been very very good on interfaith dialogue uh, with with uh, you know the particularly the Muslim but also the Christian communities of, in, at uh, at NYU um, welcoming everybody to the, to the actually it's the Bronfman Center named for my father um, at NYU so it's I can tell you that it's a battle we have to fight every single day and it really is um, but if we if we shy away from it we're for sure gonna lose. So I think we need to really understand that it's a challenge, but, but it's one we need to continue to fight on a daily basis. Sure, we need to keep fighting this battle. And uh, 
as you said, these organizations, Hillel, AJC, uh, are central in um, changing the narrative uh, all around North America. I also think that um, the study of history plays a big part of it for the new generation, for, for my generation, um, it, especially people who are not exposed to the Jewish community, who are not Jews on campuses. It's difficult to get mixed up with all different kinds of narratives because uh, people don't, people are not learning history. The young generation. So that's that's absolutely that's absolutely true, Dan. The 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 risk in that is that they get told the wrong narrative, right? So there there are multiple narratives, and honestly, one of the big problems, I think, for the Palestinians today, is that they've created this narrative for themselves. The leadership has created this narrative that's very hard to walk back from. You know, it's it's different for the, for the people in the Emirates. They didn't have this narrative. Uh, and of being oppressed and being, um, you know, all the things that the Palestinians say about about, about the, the Israelis. So the, we've got to be careful and we've got to make sure that we tell our narrative, not a, Israel is the greatest, you know, perfect country because no country is perfect and no people are perfect and they're going to be some crazies who do crazy things. But in general, what, what we do as a community, how careful we are, how thoughtful we are in general, not every single person is perfect, um, but the gifts we've brought to the world, the gifts we bring, do you know how many, I mean, people don't know how many Syrians who get injured, badly injured from internal fighting in Syria come to the Northern border and bring their injured across to be taken care of in Israeli hospitals. They don't talk about it because they don't want to talk about it, but it's a fact. And of course, Israeli hospitals, Israeli doctors take care of them for free. I mean, it's one of a thousand stories and I'm sure Aaron and Chaim and Sandy would all could all tell you, could each tell you hundreds of stories just like that. Um, and it happens every day. You know, you know that there are Israelis that wherever there's a disaster in the, around the world, who's the first ones to show up? Whether whether it was in, in Greece with, when the Syrians were all trying to leave, all, all the Arabs were trying to leave Syria and get to Europe, whether it was in Haiti when there was the, the earthquakes, you know, we're the first ones to show up. It's, it's not the narrative that people want to tell. So we need to make sure we tell an unvarnished, accurate story of Israel. Because if we try to make it too perfect, you're not credible. But the reality is amazing. If we just get the real reality apart with some of the warts, because we have warts, and that's what we bring, as I said, when we do what's called Project Interchange at AJC. We bring people and we show them, look, we're not perfect, but on balance, we're, it's, this is a pretty amazing country of people, and we really do want peace. It's a battle we have to keep fighting and uh, you've been fighting and your family's been fighting it for, for a long time. So, so thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, at this point, I want to remind everybody who's uh, joined us today uh, that if you have any questions for Matthew, uh, please type them into the chat at any point and we will get to them at the end. Uh, now I'd like to turn to a few more uh, personal questions so that we can get to know you better. Um, so President Abraham Lincoln once said that important principles must be inflexible. French writer Honoré de Balzac wrote that there are no principles, there are only circumstances. <laughs> so which of these quotes do you prioritize when you're raising your children? And have you ever had moments in your life, in your personal or professional life when... So I would definitely, first of all, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and um, again, I, you know, you never know if, if we talked about it started with my family's name. I grew up at, uh, at 60 Lincoln Avenue in, in Westchester, New York. So per perhaps that's why I'm uh, not just because he saved the, saved the United States, saved the union. Um, and I do believe that you have to stick to your principles. Uh, and I make that pretty clear to my kids. Um, I also make clear to them that education is the single most important gift I can give them. Um, but no, I, 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 I really don't subscribe to ever compromising on your principles. Um, and I, and, you know, circumstances, um, circumstances actually are the great test of your principles, uh, because we are all challenged all the time, um, with ethical dilemmas, um, and you know, 
they say, and again, I don't know who the day is, perhaps the rabbis, the sages, they say that when, when you die and go to heaven, uh, the first question you're asked is not, did you keep kosher? Did you keep Shabbos? Did you give charity? They say the first question is, were you ethical in your business dealings? And the query is, why is that the question? You know, if you're a butcher, did you ever overcharge a little bit because, you know, you could, you know, did, when you put that meat on the scale, did you put your finger on it to just wait or whatever? Because it's an easy place to cheat in, in business. It's so much easier. Look, not that many people are going to go and murder somebody or steal, but they're, so the question is, were you, were you ethical at all of your business dealings? And I think because when you look, we're all made with temptation, right? That's part of uh, the of creation, right? God, God created us with both good and evil inclination and the struggles to always, to, to, to win that battle on a daily basis. So no, I believe in principles and I don't believe in circumstances other than I think circumstances provide you the challenges to, uh, to live up to the principles you set for yourself. And look, we all, we all fall down, right? We all fall down. Um, we fall down in our parenting, we fall down in all sorts of ways, but we, hopefully we learn, hopefully we all learn. And that's our goal, right? To continually learn and be better people. Um, and that's, you know, I like to think about it as the, the ever expanding concentric circles. You need, you need to start with your nuclear family in terms of principles and values. Um, and, uh, and then you move out to the next sort of layer of your family, greater family community, Jewish community, and then, and then globally. Um, but to me, if you're not, if you're not, and, my, and by the way, you know, that's, I think, again, that's, that's something one, one gets from your parents. You have to live by example. Um, to not compromise on your ethics and your values, you know. And I look. One of the things that's important to me and a core value for me is to is to do the charitable work that I do. And and there are times when you know you're conflicted. I want to be home with my family. There's something going on, and I want to be on the road doing doing a Limud conference in in Moldova, um, uh, or in Israel. We're going to Hillel next year for. Uh, the opening of the new Hillel House in Rio, um, you know, and those, those are core values of, of, of making the world a better place and tikkun olam and blah, blah, blah. I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean in a good way. And uh, so you have to make choices. And I think by demonstrating those, the values and those things that are important to you uh, is, is the way we teach our kids. And hopefully they will each come up, you know, I, one, of, one of my kids is having some marital issues right now. And, and he and I are having a lot of conversations about it. And that's a great thing. We're, we're able to talk about it. Um, and, we're, and I'm able to talk to them about what I think is important in terms of the values and how things are going. And you know what? It'll be, it'll be what it'll be, but as long as it's done, whatever happens, as long as it's done so that everybody can hold their head up high. Um, I think sure. that's, that's the thing. That's, that's great. What you need to do. That's great. Uh, you, I, I like that you brought up uh, uh, the idea of business. A lot of, uh, a lot of businessmen, uh, and people in general argue that uh, the idea of business ethics is an oxymoron. There are two concepts, business and ethics, that do not and cannot uh, go together. So you disagree with that? I completely disagree with that. Completely. I, I think that uh, that I'm not. I'm not I, I I don't know. I think that you know, you you always want to. Uh, negotiate, right? You always want to, to do the right thing by your constituencies being, you know, your shareholders, your customers, and your employees, your co-workers. We call them co-workers at, at, at IKEA here in Israel. Um, but no, but there's no room, in my mind, there's no room for e any unethical behavior ever. Um, so, I, I don't I don't subscribe to that theory that you can't mix business and, and ethics and values. That the way we've been able to keep our, our our senior executive team is because we are very clear about that um, in in every single way. Uh, we're very clear about that, and 
you know, there's, there's an adage, the customer's always right. And uh, I don't know, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're we, um, we have to, from our, from our standpoint, we have to take that stand. It's just, you know, my, my partner in business is, uh, it's also uh, feels very, very similar to, to the way I feel about that. I mean, there's no, there's no, they say there's no light between us on that. It's, uh, we are completely co-joined in our views that uh, the only way to be ultimately successful in business is through an ethical behavior. And, and that's got to permeate the organization. Um, which, um, which brings me to our uh, next topic. So last week, Jewish people all around the world celebrated the holiday of Simchat Torah, and we started reading the Torah from the very beginning. Now, the first portion of the Torah is Parashat Bereshit. It tells of uh, God's creation of our world, the sky, the sea, the animals, plants, and people. It's a story of a fresh start. So my question for you is if you had the chance to start your life all over again, what would you change, if anything? And what would you hold dear? Well, we definitely don't have enough time for the things I would change. Uh, however, everything that I would change, frankly, has been a learning experience. Um, you know, we've I've, I've made probably in my 61 years, I've made as many mistakes as any other 61 year old has made. Um, the question is, have I, have I learned from them? Um, and I hope so. I hope so. I think I, I hope I'm a better parent today to my two little ones than I was to the first ones, just because of experience and, and learning and patience, et cetera. Uh, what do I hold dear? Um, I think that's pretty easy in fact i i hold dear the values that my parents gave to me um, and i would never want to change those values um, you know family is is really 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 important to me um, you know as i'm sure you all know from if you've read anything about me that i i've been divorced a couple times obviously i'm not proud of that having said that uh, I am married to the greatest woman in the world for me. She's a, she's remarkable in, in every way, and and I couldn't possibly be happier. Uh, and my children love her. It's not the route uh, that I had mapped out for myself when I was getting engaged the first time at the age of 22 years old. Uh, I certainly do not advise my children to get married as young as I did. Um, but I don't, but, you know, again, from each marriage, I took something, I have something, uh, and, uh, you know, you learn. Um, there, there definitely are things that, um, that I, would, I would have done differently in my life, but I think that's, if you can't look back and say that, then, uh, then I think you probably haven't learned or grown very much in, in the years. Right. Learning is... is is what we do, what the Jewish people are known for. They, they, they have this instilled love of learning. So uh, yeah, thank you for, for touching on that. that. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, we're, we're almost uh, at an end for uh, our chat, Matthew, but uh, for all of those listening uh, and, and that, that are joining us today, I'd like to remind you one last time uh, to submit your questions for Matthew in the chat. Uh, we'll come to them uh, at the end. But to finish off um, our conversation right now, uh, Matthew, I want to play a little game. Yeah. So okay. I'm going to say a word. <laughs> and Uh-oh, I'm getting nervous now. <laughs> and you tell me the first association that comes to mind. And it'll be a speed round. I say um, family, OK, for example, and uh, you give me two, three words that you associate th with that. So um, holidays and uh, love, okay? And that's very abstract, okay. <laughs> a little bit more specific than my example, um, okay. but, uh, but we'll, 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 we'll do a speed round of that, okay? Are you re ready to go? So somebody okay. somebody uh, keeping points, keeping score? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, all all right. right, I'll see what I can do here. Uh, this is going to be a little embarrassing, I'm afraid, but. <laughs> okay, your first word is home. Uh, family, food. Uh, money. Charity. Social media. Annoying. Artificial intelligence. Uh, scary. Uh, very scary, actually. Jewish mother. Complicated. Uh, food. Um, and loving. Rain. Rain. Rain is uh, growth. Red wine. Red wine. Um, red. Red wine. <laughs> okay. Um, Hanukkah. Laughter, joy, and guilt. Limuda Fasio. Uh, joy, family. Limuda Fasio, Canada. Uh, almost home. Okay. <laughs> so if, if you, you heard it right here, we moved up to Pursue Canada, according to uh, the chairman of our steering committee, is almost home. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for your time and for all your efforts that you invest into, into our incredible organization. Uh, we would like to open up the floor for some questions at this point, and I'm thrilled to be passing off the microphone to the Deputy Director of Limuda FSU, Natasha Chechik. Natasha, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Matthew. Dan, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. You were wonderful as usual. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so we have a lot of questions from the audience. I hope we will reach every one of them. So we will start with Sandy Khan, <laughs> our dear co-founder. Sandy, so, are you with us? Matthew. Thank you, Natasha. Matthew, it was wonderful to hear you. And um, I wanna make a comment before I ask my question. And that is that <clears throat> I've worked very closely with Matthew for the last 15 years. And I have tell, to tell you that he is one of the most classy, um, compassionate people I know. And everything he has said I saw in living proof that he really is one of the most moral and ethical human beings. And um, without him, we would have you would never be where it is today. Matthew, what turns you on about we would have you when you go to an event? First of all, thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for those very beautiful comments. Um, you Look, you and I, you and I, and, and Chaim and, and Aaron have been to, and, and of course Natasha have been to so many events together. And honestly, it's it's pretty much the same thing every time. Which is when when I see the people in the lectures engaged, and particularly after the lectures in the hallways in the evenings, to see the connections that people are making to each other, and to see the joy and the pride that that uh, participants take in being there. It just, it's the energy and the energy that they, that the students, the participants have is what, what keeps me coming back. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. And we pass the virtual mic to the other half of, you know, we would have a few establishment founders, Chaim Chesler, please. First of all, we're very privileged to uh, have known and met uh, Matthew Brofman. And uh, what Sandra said, it, I don't have to repeat. I just uh, agree with every word. But I want to uh, make short uh, point of uh, three events which characterize uh, Matthew Hoffman. Number one is when we met in Cordova, where the Maimonite lived. And uh, I came to him with the idea of uh, Livud. And I thought because it's Moldova and because his grandparents come from Moldova, maybe I had the chance. I explained to him what is the mood. And he said, Chaim Chesler, what do you want? I said, I want $25,000. I said, and then he was, you know, Matthew is speaking to the point. He doesn't like to talk much. He likes to talk to the point. And he said, Chaim, look, I heard you. 
I gave you $25,000 on one condition, that the $25,000 proved to be the greatest idea. And if it was a failure, I don't want to know who you are. And if I meet you in the street, just go to the other side of the street. That was the rule at the time. And ever since, for the last 15, 16 years, thank God, we are together and we are getting stronger and stronger, starting with one country in Russia, and now we operate 11 uh, countries. And thank God, we will overcome the corona and will be in full engine all over the world. We now try to do mainly in Zoom, but we haven't given up. Number two is to do how I find the place where his grandparents uh, lived. We traveled to Moldova. We look for a uh, few places and we were given a different name and I went there and eventually we found the place and we found the synagogue. Found the place, it's actually on the border with Ukraine and uh, also a very play, famous place, Vinica. And we brought to the ceremony when we went there with the Chabadic rabbi from Vinica, he took all, all our services. That's number one. Number two is to do with Canada and the Bronfmans. As you know, we have created a book, it's called Limud, Let My People Know, which gives you all the story, what you heard a little bit from Matthew, a little bit from uh, Sandra, Aaron, myself, the story of Limud FSU, how we created in 15 years something that overcome 70,000 participants. And uh, we went to Canada to our first conference, I think it's Blue Mountain, and we said we have to do something special about Canada. And you know, originally the history of Zionism, that one of the proposal of the Zionist movement is to create the Jewish states, not in Palestine, Israel, not in Uganda and Africa, but to do it in Canada. So we went to the place, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, it's called uh, uh, Regina, which is the capital of uh, such as Chuan. They already created some kind of settlement and we went there and we saw the place in written in Yiddish even, I'm talking about three, four years ago. It's still there and there's still Jews living there that were sent from Ukraine to build the Jewish state in Sechkuan. Then we went back to Regina, we met, a, we met the super judge of the city of Regina, a Jew, and we told them about who we are and Matthew Brogman and et cetera. He said, Mr. Chester, I want to tell you something, that the grandfather of Matthew Brockman lived in Regina, and I'm going to take you now with my car into the house where the, uh, Edgar and Charles were playing with a barrel of wine. So he took us to the place. I was so excited. I called Matthew to New York and I said, listen, I see where is the playground of your, parent, of your parents. It was very, very moving. And then we understood a little bit more and we brought the Chabad chief rabbi of Regina into our limud in Blue Mountains. And the last things which I believe was one of the ISIS point is when we uh, have in Israel a limud, a memory of Ilan Ramon, the first astronaut, Israeli astronaut that perished, brought rockets in space. And we went to the Russian embassy and said, listen, we can bring you American astronaut. And just in return, bring us the first men that walk on the, on the, on the, on the space. They were very excited. And in Limut Be'er Sheva, me managed to bring Andre Le Space, there were another astronaut and for us, and Matthew Brovan told me, Chaim, I don't believe we managed to do what the Israeli government wouldn't do. So the reason why Matthew and Aaron and Sandra and myself and the entire team led it by Natasha, of course, with all the volunteers around the world, believe in us because we tried to exercise and to bring into reality the dreams that everybody has in their own heart. I hope we will continue to do so with your help, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks, Chaim. Thank you, Chaim. Okay, so now I'm glad to invite Jeremy E. Pook. Jeremy, are you with us? Yes, Ask Natasha. This question. Yes, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes. Um, and thank you, Matthew and Dan and Chaim, Sandy, and all of Limud FSU. 
Uh, Matthew, your comments were really wonderful today, um, as always. Uh, your comments about intermarriage first, I just wanted to touch upon something that can make you feel better, but really is very scary when it comes to the Russian-speaking Jewish diaspora. Uh, at least here in Boston, where I'm located, the uh, leading Jewish demographic institution in the world is based at Brandeis University, the Cohen Center. Um, they found it in a study in 2015 that Russian-speaking Jews lead all other Jews in greater Boston for very much wanting their children to marry Jewish, even higher than in married American Jews. But yet, Russian-speaking Jews are on a pathway to 80% plus intermarriage because of such low levels of Jews. So here, we're very thankful to Limud FSU's efforts, but this same study found that among intermarried Jews, only 7% of intermarried Jews, this interface historically, where Russian-speaking Jews are extremely low Jewish engagement-wise because of the legacy of the Soviet era, but yet very high wanting their children to marry Jewish. So the question to you is, now that we are living in, the COVID, in this COVID world where Limud is not meeting in person, what opportunities does Limud FSU have that we're now living in this Zoom world to do even more to reconnect with RSJs throughout the RSJ diaspora? What, what's your vision for that? So Chaim and, and Sandy and Natasha can, can expand on this if, if they want. Um, you know, we've been since, since we actually pivoted pretty quickly to uh, a lot of, of online uh, Zoom interaction. We have one coming up actually in two days where, where I'll be interviewing uh, uh, Ambassador Ron Dermer. Uh, so we, we've had a number, uh, Aaron of course has been very, very involved in this as well, uh, of Zoom opportunities. So if in a funny, in a funny way, the, the engagement is, is easier in, in that rather than having, if you live in, in Toronto, or if you live in Boston, rather than having sort of one opportunity a year to go to a big conference and then whatever the follow-up is, you know, there, there's uh, Limud FSU uh, Zoom opportunities quite often. We should probably be, try to do more. It's, you know, uh, but I, I think that, you know, this is, this is a huge issue and it, and it gets, again, we would, we would love to do more, but in fact, we're, we're the spark, right? We're the spark that's, that's supposed to, and hopefully in our mission is so that post whatever the Limud FSU engagement is, that people sort of start their, re-engage with their Jewish journey wherever that is. And that ultimately that will lead to less intermarriage, more Jewish engagement, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not the ones there every day. And unless, unless you're, you know, lighting Shabbat candles, by the way, even if you're just lighting Shabbat candles and turning on the TV after dinner, it's like at least light Shabbat candles, have challah, bless your children um, on, fr on Friday nights. You know, little things that the children remember. You know, my, my kids in their 20s still line up when they're with me to get blessed from, you know, when they were babies on, on a Friday night. And those little things, you know, even if they're going to go out with their friends after dinner, um, just it, it, get, it creeps into their soul. And that's something we can do as Leewood FSU. Our job is to sort of create that spark, re recreate that spark, whatever. Uh, but it's got to be done in the homes and it's got to be done in the local communities. Thank you, Matthew. We have another question actually regarding the issue of the intermarriage. And the question is from Alex Katz. Dear Matthew, how do you feel about the role Jewish day schools can play in stopping assimilation and intermarriage? So look, I said, I, you know, my kids, uh, my younger kids um, have mostly gone to Jewish day schools. Um, again, I think the more you edu we educate our children Jewishly, the, the better off they're going to be, whether it's, whether it's Jewish day schools and Jew or Jewish camping. Um, you know, I, I, listen, I'm a huge proponent of it. So uh, it's, it, that's, a, that's an easy question for me. I, I think that, again, and getting your children involved, like there's a great program called LIFT, which is Leaders for Tomorrow. It's an AJC program for 
for high school juniors to learn about advocacy so that when they go onto the college campuses that Dan asked me about earlier, uh, our Jewish students are prepared for the onslaught they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna run into. But I think Jewish day schools are absolutely one of the great defenders of, of the Jewish future. Um, and not just because you end up being with more Jewish kids or those are your friends, but because they instill for you values uh, that hopefully you, you'll, you'll be comfortable with and want to then perpetuate by virtue of marriage and, and bringing up Jewish children. Thank you. So we have another. Well, she's asking, would you like for your kids to live in Israel, actually? <laughs> well, my wife's Israeli. Uh, and as we said at the beginning, I, I'm in Israel now and my three-year-old is in Ghan here. Um, I, I would be, you know, look, I want my kids to be happy. And, uh, but my, my, the two babies that, that I have with, with, uh, with Melanie, uh, I'd be, I, we actually both want them to do the army. Uh, and I'd be very happy if, if they ended up living here. Very happy, actually. All right, and now we have another question from Einat Livni. Uh, Matthew, how do you see in today's world, especially the current online world, educating students more in fact days while everyone is so Zoom fatigued? Uh, well, first of all, it depends on the age group of the children you're talking about. I think that Zoom is really, really, really hard. Um, I don't, I don't know how children uh, who are used to being, you know, engaged with each other, interacting with each other in a class hours a day. I think it's a, an incredible challenge and uh, I wish I had a good answer for it. Um, you know, and, and you have an environment where, where you know, you have mostly have two, two working parents even if they're trying to work from home, I don't, I don't know. I think this is one of the great, great challenges. Look, Zoom is a lot better than nothing, but is it, is it a substitute for actual learning in school? No, I don't think it is. I don't, I think it, look, my, my 14 year old was doing Zoom classes for, you know, from uh, end of spring break to the end of the year last year. And, uh, you know, they, they, they probably did a third of the classwork that they would have done had they been actually in school. Um, so I, I don't really know. I think that it's, I wouldn't say, I, I don't want to say, assuming this goes through next March in some way, shape or form, I don't want to say it's a lost year because it's not totally lost, but it's, I think it's an incredible challenge. I mean, for my three-year-old to try to connect on Zoom, to his, you know, teacher and friends, he lasts three, four minutes. That's it. He, you know, he, it's, yeah. it's impossible. Um, so, uh, look, it, it's better than nothing, but um, it's it's not great. All right. So now we have quite an interesting question. Uh, in light of the fight against anti-Semitism, uh, it's okay. The, the question is in Russian, so I will try my best. I will do my best to translate it to English. Uh, Felix okay. from Israel asking, in light of the fight against anti-Semitism, what do you think? Do you think it will be advisable uh, to educate not only university students or professors, but also some prominent writers who, to a greater extent, shape public opinion? Uh, he says that in Germany, for example, there is such a practice. Foundations invite certain authors for a long time. Uh, who then, you know, some time after that, um, writing in their books about the issues about anti-Semitism and Israel. Uh, so it's kind of more like a cultural questions. So what do you think about that? So look, the, the, more, the more people who have influence uh, on what we read, what we see, that have a balanced view, the better. The problem today, and look, thank God, uh, Facebook made the, the announcement it made the other day uh, about actually banning uh, Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism uh, 
uh, from, the, from their platform. Uh, it's the first time that a social media giant has done so. Uh, it's hugely, hugely important. So, you know, people who write books, unfortunately, the millennials don't read books nearly to the extent that they uh, get their information from social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, Google, whatever it is. So I, what, what they're doing in Germany, and if, you're, if they're trying to get authors and things to, to uh, be more balanced, that's great. But I think, I think the, the fight is more on the social media fight. Uh, and I think getting people, uh, look, educating, everybody's a good thing, right? It, there's, no, there's no downside in that. It's, it's kind of why Limud exists, why we went uh, to Vienna in, at, the end of, uh, at the end of February to go to Matthausen. Uh, you know, there, we, do, we do these things because it's really important to, to bring others and see, and as we talked about earlier, to keep, to keep those memories alive. But today I think the fight is, is much more social media. It's much more in sound bites, unfortunately. Um, and I think we have, to, we have to shape the narrative in a different way, but, Again, there's no downside in doing it. I'm just not sure that it's going to have as much impact as, as things like the Facebook announcement and trying to get others to put positive uh, spins out, not spins, positive facts out there, the, the true facts, not, not the fake news uh, about Israel, but the real facts about Israel out there on social media and different platforms. Thank you. So we have a lot more questions, but I think we're going to ask maybe two yeah maybe two, two more. short questions yes and then we'll finish so what advice would you give young jews trying to succeed in the business world well i'm not sure that i, I would limit it to jews i would i would give this probably the same advice to anybody um and the, the first thing is is pretty simple is to to follow your passion um you know uh as, you, as we all know, I, I grew up with, with plenty of resources and the, and the, the only thing that, that I would, I thought was, you know, I've got to do whatever I do, I have to do it the best I can do it. Um, so, you know, I would learn and learn and learn, ask as many questions as you can. I would go, I would get a graduate degree for sure. Um, I was very lucky to be able to go to, to, to business school. Um, and, you know, I, th I think that, you know, I, I'll give, give you an example. So when my, when my daughter, having worked for three years after college, wanted to go to business school and she got into business school and I, and I told her there were, uh, there were three things I really wanted for her to get from her business school experience, um, which I hope, I hope somebody finds part of this amusing anyway. Um, I said, the first thing is really get a, an amazing understanding of finance because no matter what business you're in, you, you need to understand finance. And she had, she had marketing and branding and other things, but really getting, I said, two, use the network, meet as many people as you can, because you never know, you know, I went to graduate school a really long time ago, and it's amazing how that network still exists today. Some, some of my closest friends are from business school, and it's always one, two, three connections away. It's unbelievable. And third, I said, please find a nice Jewish boy who can earn a living. Uh, so I, I would kind of give that advice to everybody. And since you asked about particularly Jews, I would give that advice to, to the Jewish world. Like really, you know, go and get that extra degree. It's important and use the networks, study hard, learn as much as you can. Don't think, you're, don't think you know uh, everything. And the, only, the last thing I would say is, you know, in this world where we read about startups that go from zero to unicorns, um, you forget how many people how many of those founders failed multiple times, how the overnight success took 15 and 20 years to build. Uh, don't be in such a rush. Um, everybody wants it today, tomorrow. Build your business, build it from the ground up. Uh, look, at, look at Aaron, Aaron's a fantastic example of somebody who you know, took, he's, he's you know, doing incredibly well. It didn't happen in a day, it didn't happen in a month, it didn't happen in a one or two years. Uh, it takes time, it takes perseverance, it takes dedication. You're going to stumble, you're going to get back up and, uh, and do it all ethically and morally. Thank you. And I think it will be very fitting to finish this Q&A with a question about the future. 
how do you imagine the future of Limo de Fisu basically in five or 10 years? Um, so, you know, it's funny, I was talking today to somebody about business and saying, you know, we like to plan and COVID has, has made planning impossible. So what Limud is gonna be in the next six to 12 months, I don't know. I assume it's gonna be much more Zoom, unfortunately, and, and much less in person. But five to 10 years from now, the world should hopefully be back to normal, assuming it is. Um, I'd like, you know, I mentioned we've touched 70,000. I, I would like to be able to touch another 70 or 80,000 young Russian Jews, or not even young, just Russian Jews around the world. I would like, uh, I don't remember, and I apologize to the gentleman's name from Boston. I would like for us to do as much as we can to create that spark so that we can stem the intermarriage uh, to the extent we can help convince people to send their kids to Jewish day schools or Jewish camps. Again, for the goal of creating Jewish learning and Jewish pride, uh, Jewish values, uh, I think that's our mission uh, for Limud FSU for the next five, 10, whatever number of years. And I look forward to being a part of it, uh, not only with our two co-founders and, and Aaron, but with the next generation of, of leaders that are gonna hopefully come up and start taking even more leadership positions. And one of these days we can just be the, the, uh, you know, the chairman emeritus, president emeritus and, and let uh, new people come in and, and do the, the the real legwork. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much. And it's really my pleasure to pass the mic to our country director of Limud FSU Canada, our dear Mila Wojhansky. Mila. Myself. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, Matthew, thank you so much for finding the time to do this interview. It's a real uh, privilege for us. You know, when I came to Canada many, many, many years ago, certainly the name Bronfman was always very closely associated to the Jewish community in my mind, uh, somebody who didn't have the privilege of growing up with the with the Jewish community in the center of the country. And, and it was amazing and it is amazing. And when we started Limud FSU Canada, just to know that the chairman of the steering committee of, and one of the international leaders is somebody who is so closely associated with Canada is a big deal for us. Thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge um, certainly Aaron Frankel, president of Limwood FSU, Haim Chesler, founder of Limwood FSU, Sandy, the co-founder of Limwood FSU. Um, I also want to acknowledge Michal Grayevsky, who is a very good and a big friend of Limwood FSU, president of JFS International. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, all your support. I think it's it's an amazing thing to be able to talk to your leaders the way you and Aaron uh, shared with us uh, your life stories, uh, talked about your values, talked about things that are very important to you because they're also important to us. And to hear you talk about the importance of maintaining those values and feeling proud about being Jewish is especially um, important to the Russian Jewish community for us certainly our children and our grandchildren uh, for many of us are growing up in a different environment but today with anti-semitism on the rise with the fears that we're all having and in Canada too despite the fact that we are kind of uh, quieter than some other countries and on campuses and in just life in general it is so important to hear people like you talk about these values uh, and, and hear the, the passion that you have about Jewish life, about the Jewish soul. Thank you very much again. I would like to remind everybody that uh, our next e-festival will take place on November the 15th. Unfortunately, we had once again to postpone our in-person event. We are hoping to have one in the summer, which will probably um, have a different, a little bit different uh, format. We are hoping to have it outdoors and maybe uh, on the camping site. Uh, but today, please uh, stay tuned for our e-festival on November the 15th. Again, thank you very much again, everybody. Thank you for joining us. 
thank you for being part of Limud FSU. Limud FSU has become a very important part, a part of the Canadian Jewish life, especially for the Russian Jews and not only Russian Jews. I want to tell you that the level of uh, experience and the speakers that we bring and the, uh, vo our volunteers, our amazing team of volunteers, uh, make it so attractive to everybody, not just Russian Jews. So please remember November the 15th. And of course, I want to thank our uh, Dan Petrenko, who's done once again an amazing, amazing job. Thank you very <laughs> much, Dan. Thank you, Dan. It's, it's great. Thank you very much, everybody. We will see you very soon on November the 15th. God bless everybody. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye. Bye.